Thank you very much also for the opportunity to be here in Dublin and share a few thoughts with you on uh, the Middle East. Let me first explain uh, what the uh, point person on the Middle East does. The title is much longer, but just to have an understanding what uh, the former title is, Special Representative on the Middle East Peace Process, EU Special Representative on the Middle East Peace Process. Um, I have been appointed by, or I have been presented by Cathy Ashton, the High Representative and Vice President <coughs> of the European Union, and uh, appointed by the 27 foreign ministers. Um, and uh, I'm the, the, the task which I have, the mandate which has been negotiated by the 27 foreign ministers, uh, concerns, uh, in short, the relationship between Israel uh, and or the, or the relationship between Israel and its neighbor countries. Um, this is also Lebanon and Syria, which for obvious reasons are not on the agenda right now, at least as far as the relationship with Israel and the possible peace process is concerned. Um, the core issue is Palestine, the Palestinian question, and uh, when the time my mandate was negotiated, uh, the assumption was that the relationship between Israel and Jordan and Israel and Egypt would be more or less need to be managed. Uh, as we all know, this has been had, gotten a different connotation right now, but this is the context in which um, I'm working. Uh, when I left uh, Damascus this January, uh, the situation uh, or there was uh, there was already getting uh, very critical. Uh, we were more and more finding ourselves in a new environment in the Arab uh, scene, and I would in the, in the Arab field, and I would like to dwell a little bit uh, on this to set the scene for where the Palestinian-Israel conflict stays right now. We do find ourselves, we means the European, find ourselves in a new uh, strategic environment at the southern border. Uh, we find that all the former the coalitions which we have witnessed for 20, 30, 40 years, are about to change. We don't yet know exactly how they will change, but it certain is that they do change. And if we go a little bit country by country, just to, uh, to underline what I'm meaning, uh, we have seen uh, Tunisia, which is probably the country which, as we can see it right now, is, has started the Arab rebellion or the Arab Spring, uh, which seems to be the country which is most easily trying to adopt itself to the new situation. In Egypt, we have the Brussels motherhood, uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which is in charge, uh, which puts a lot of questions also to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, we have the uh, Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel, uh, and the question was, would they honor the peace treaty? And before uh, Morsi was elected and afterwards, the, uh, the Egyptian position was, we will honor our international agreements. Um, but the relationship with Israel is something which they are, at this moment, trying to restructure and trying to see how they develop it. Syria was always an important player more in the sense of a, a spoiler than to be a constructive person, a constructive partner. How this will work out at the moment, we don't know. But it certainly uh, has not this role anymore. What the role of Syria will be, we will have to see. Iraq, for the long time, was a very proud uh, country and an important player. Uh, it has lost this during Saddam Hussein more and more, uh, now over the, the years uh, also, but it is certainly a country which will come back uh, as it is big, as it is a traditional country, as, an, as it has a lot of oil reserves. Saudi Arabia, again, is a proud player, but they're very much focused on the domestic issues, who will become, uh, how will the, the future relationship will be. 
Uh, the Gulf countries are economically important, but they are scared also, or concerned, I would rather say, from a prospect of a strengthening Iran. Uh, and Turkey is a new player. We do see new coalitions, and we don't know exactly how these coalitions will work out. But I'll just give you a few examples of what we have had been observing in the last, uh, uh, last months. Uh, the relationship between uh, Turkey and Egypt has become much stronger. As we know, Turkey has, been move, has moved itself much more into its regional context for an, a variety of reasons. For a while, lots of Arab states looked at Turkey as a, uh, as a modern Islamist uh, state, as a certain example. Um, Turkey has re-established its relationship then with uh, re-strengthened Egypt. Um, and there is no real concept uh, visible there, but we, so, we, we see that these countries are moving together. Egypt itself uh, was, ha has re-emerged as a strong power. Uh, it has a problem under Mubarak because the country was uh, in the situation it was before. Now it is back. We don't know exactly how it is back, but it's determined to play a role. And one interesting example is the possibility of Egypt finding new coalition partners not only with Turkey, but also uh, with Iran. You may remember that Iran and Egypt were on very bad terms. There was the, the uh, uh, potential of uh, an attack on Mubarak, I think it was in, in Addis Ababa a couple of years ago, uh, which failed, um, but which was attributed to Iranian sources. Uh, and since then, the relationship with Iran and uh, Egypt were extremely bad. Now, Morsi uh, made two steps, two signals. One, he went to the summit of the non-alignment movement a couple of weeks ago to uh, Tehran, which was the first visit. Um, and then he established, or he brought the idea in of what they called an Islamic quartet concerning Syria. When they saw that the situation in Syria was deteriorated more and more, he suggested to have a group of Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Turkey, and Egypt to discuss the situation. They didn't get very far, but uh, and they only met in this context uh, on the level uh, once, not on the level of I think deputy ministers. But this was a context which was impossible to imagine a couple of years ago. Uh, so we see that things are moving, and we see that uh, we're finding ourselves in, uh, in, in an area where lots of the players themselves don't, you know, don't know exactly what the future will be, uh, but uh, uh, we see the changes. One country I uh, should add, and that's Qatar. Very small, a uh, lot of gas, a lot of money. They're using and they're using them in various contexts, in the Syrian context, uh, with financial support, some financial support, but particularly through Al Jazeera, uh, which took a clear position in the uh, Syrian context. Uh, we've seen it uh, in the inner Palestinian conflict, Hamas and Fatah, they tried the mediation. And we now saw that a few weeks ago, the Emir of Qatar went to Gaza to pay a visit and to even leave an ambassador in Gaza who is in charge of the reconstruction process of uh, amount of, of for, uh, roughly $400 million which the Qataris put into Gaza. So we see things are moving. You will have realized that in this whole context, yeah. there's one country which I didn't name, and that's Israel. Uh, Israel is uh, in this whole changing environment of the, str the strategic picture, uh, not present as an actor. Uh, they are uh, obviously concerned uh, and, and observing it extremely carefully, what's going on. But they are not able to act uh, constructively in this context. The reason is, as we know, uh, obvious. It's the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Now, this Israel-Palestinian conflict for a long time has been also a pretext um, of many Arab states. And one result of the Arab rebellion is in the Arab Spring is that one argument 
uh, of the Arab states has been proven um, unrealistic. They said, we cannot move on our domestic front and our domestic reforms unless the conflict in Israel, the inner conflict in Israel, uh, Palestine continues. This obviously was wrong because we have seen otherwise. But what is still true is that the conflict is so much influences the public arena in the Arab world that uh, despite some of the private announcements some leaders are doing, uh, are doing uh, they don't feel that they have the, the, the public support to moving in this direction. So as long as this palestinian israel conflict continues, Israel uh, has great difficulties to be an active player in this changing environment. I was discussing this a lot with Israelis. And the Israeli answer is, uh, how can you expect us to do this? We, see, uh, we don't know what's happened in Egypt. We see a difficult security situation on the, Sinai, on the Sinai. We have observed the situation in Gaza. We don't know what's happening with Jordan, uh, Syria, etc., etc. How can you expect from us to making a peace agreement or uh, any sort of agreement with the Palestinians in this difficult moment? I think this is a fair argument, looking at the history of experience and the perception and, and their very concrete fears. I think this is true. Uh, my counter-argument is uh, that uh, the military protection, which every state, in particular also Israel, needs in this context, uh, and this is our ex European experience, always needs a supplement of a political frame. Um, we are right now in a discussion, and the situation is moving, but this is the situation, in also the political situation, in which we find ourselves. Now, let me just say a few words to the European position on the conflict uh, in the Middle East. Over the last weeks and months, uh, the careful observer, and I almost dare to say the diplomatic observer, has, may have observed a couple of changes in the European position uh, towards uh, the situation. And when I mean European position, I mean the consensus among 27. Lots of positions were known before and were advocated by this party and opposed by the other one. But what is interesting about the European position is that we find, define a consensus of all 27. The first was in, this, uh, in, in May when the European foreign ministers in their council conclusions, that means the, the monthly results of the discussions and the consensus te uh, text which, emanates, uh, which comes out of it, declared that uh, they are highly concerned about the so-called viability of the two-state solution because of two factors. One, the ongoing settlement activities of Israel, and B, the difficult financial situations of the Palestinians. Now, you may say, why is this so, uh, so interesting? The answer is Europeans always were putting topics on the international agenda. It took time because 20, to get 27 or 20 or however we were at a given situation uh, together obviously is, is, is a time-consuming process. But this was always the strength of the European Union. And it started with 1980, the Venice Declaration, when for the first time the European Union, at that time I think we were 12, uh, mentioned uh, for the first time the, the, the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people, which meant Palestinian people as such were recognized. It went, continued with the recognition of a two-state solution, which later was also adopted by the Americans, uh, to the, uh, to the, the uh, indication the concern on the ongoing settlement activities, which is also a European issue. Those who live there could see this for a while. And now the Europeans started to draw the attention on the danger that this two-state solution might, or the viability of a two-state solution might, might, might end, because if the, the, the settlement construction continues more, <laughs> there is no more space to have a two-state solution. Again, this is not a dramatic change, but it's uh, a change in the approach, which has been confirmed also in, uh, in, in later texts which the European Union has, has decided. Uh, a second issue was, which was, became much more visible over the last days, were uh, the discussion among the Europeans, on the vote among Europeans on the observer state status of the Palestinians in the General Assembly. Uh, those of you who have observed know that in the end, I think we had 14 yes, 12 abstentions, and uh, one no vote among the European unions. 
Some people say the European Union uh, is not unified on this. On the one degree, this is evident because there were different, different votes. On the other hand, uh, we still agreed in a joint declaration uh, that uh, despite the different votes, we have two things in common. One is the basis of our policy, which is based on many years before. And secondly, of the vision of a two-state solution, even if we feel it is in danger. And therefore, uh, after the vote, we had another conclusion uh, a few days ago where the European Union gave a few new indicators uh, which will most likely shape the, the common 27 position for the, next, uh, for the next future. Indicator number one is, we said we want to have renewed structural negotiations in the year 2013. Now you may say this doesn't sound particularly uh, new because this is what we all expect. But um, as the process is ongoing and slow since a long time, I think the expression of the European Union as 27, to say in 2013 we need, and in 2013 means a date, we want to have this renewed structured uh, position as Europeans is the first expression of the 27 foreign ministers altogether. The second is that uh, European ministers, uh, for a second time in, in a relatively short context, mentioned we need international parameters. For a long time, the approach of the international community uh, has been to, uh, to create the frame for the two parties to negotiate among themselves, and we were ready to underline whatever the outcome would be. Now the European Union says maybe we have to go another, another step and define joint and common parameters. We didn't say which parameters, because this is under discussion, but we say probably we do need parameters. Uh, these are probably the most uh, important new elements uh, in the last, uh, as far as the future is concerned. And as far as the short-term approach, there was another, uh, another indicator saying that we would like to have, we would like both parties return to negotiations without preconditions. This also can now be understand if you know the context, because again you would say this doesn't sound particularly new, but it means that we want that both parties actually go back to the negotiation tables, don't start to put up preconditions this and that way in order to, to uh, only come to the room, um, but we want them to come to the room without preconditions now, because if they don't start negotiations, they will never end the negotiations. That's where the European Union stand now. That's where it's also the point when Ireland uh, will take over the uh, presidency of the European Union. You know that the presidency, since we have a high representative, has gained a different approach than it was before, but still uh, I'm happy to be in Dublin here at this occasion, and I wish Ireland for the next half year, not only in the foreign policy field where it is less important, but in the other fields, a lot of success and hope also some good ideas how to advance in this difficult file. Thank you very much.